Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to be here and uh, to be able to present um, for the first time something about Imaginator, uh, which is a study that was funded by the Clark East of England and was actually conducted in the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough NHS uh, Foundation Trust, where I was until a week ago. So, um, why focus specifically on trying to develop an intervention for just one behavior like self-harm? We know that this is a quite common behavior, in particular in uh, young uh, women, uh, that tends to sometimes resolve spontaneously over time. Um, but one in four of those who uh, start self-harming will continue doing it. Uh, after four years. And most importantly, we wanted to focus on this because uh, we know that self-harm increases greatly the risk of suicidal ideation and suicidal uh, attempts above other risk factors. Um, there are current treatments that try to focus on this behavior only, uh, but the majority of the um, reviews and uh, uh, systematic um, analysis suggests that we need more research uh, into this, into this uh, area, in particular for uh, young people. So we haven't been the only ones to think that perhaps a digital intervention could be uh, a good idea, a good solution, knowing how much young people um, access and use uh, smartphones. And these are some of the other things that are going on, at least in the UK, um, at the same time as uh, Imaginator. And when we thought of Imaginator, we had in mind in particular some of the clinical practice challenges that we were meeting every day. Um, uh, at the time, I was a psychiatrist in, in what's called a first response uh, service, which is a, like a 111 for mental health that's being piloted in, in Cambridge here. And one of this was that uh, when a young person comes with a self-harm episode in an emergency department, we very rarely have something to offer them immediately in terms of support. Um, and also that it's a behavior that happens across different diagnoses, and again, sometimes it, it gets kind of lost in what are our traditional disorder-focused uh, interventions. And also, it seems like sometimes young people who experience this fall into some sort of gap. Either they are um, present at sort of well, not severe enough in, in their distress so that we could refer them to more complex intervention. But on the other hand, uh, sometimes uh, we um, sort of label them and apologize for that as too risky to be referred to other interventions that we have as available. So bearing this in mind, we wanted to try and develop an intervention that could be uh, brief and effective, easily deliverable, for example, in, in different pathways, adapted also to be deliverable after a presentation in an emergency department, so capturing that uh, immediate window of, of risk. Um, and also, we try to have Imaginator at something that could be also a self-management tool, so something that would help young people uh, regain control and, uh, and perhaps facilitate the waiting time uh, if something more is, in terms of care is needed. So I'm going to show you a, a lot of information in the slides about the details of the research, um, but I'm not necessarily going to talk about all of it. If those who are interested in that, please come and, and ask me later. Um, what I want to focus on here is that uh, we developed the app uh, that comes with Imaginator with uh, a young people's advisory group, and it was a really fascinating three to four months work together with them and with John Harper, who's the CEO of AppShine. That's a company that uh, worked on this with us. Um, and in the study, which is a, a small feasibility study, we uh, recruited young people between the age of 16 to 25 who had experienced at least two episodes of self-harm in, in the previous three months. And what they got was uh, an assessment initially, trying to formulate what was driving this behavior for them, and then two face-to-face -face sessions of an intervention that's called functional imagery training, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute. And then they got the app, um, and then it was followed by five uh, brief phone support calls fortnightly. And we initially we developed 
uh, well, we only developed the app for Android, um, and that, as somebody mentioned already, has been a problem. So what we did was then, for those who didn't have an Android phone, we gave them um, a, a, a small phone. And uh, I don't know, but I'm really curious to see whether just that thing made a difference for, for better or, or worse. Um, so what is functional imagery training? Is training someone to use mental imagery, so visualization, to, do, um, to engage in an adaptive behavior? So in this case, um, to do something rather than self-harm. Why using mental imagery and visualization? Because we know it can impact on emotions, on behavior, and we know that often distressing images precede the moments when you feel like self-harming. And so, for example, um, they can increase uh, the distress emotions, they can drive the motivation to engage in that behavior. Um, and so addressing that aspect and encouraging people to visualize something different can be helpful. And of course, we thought that visualizing, uh, visualization techniques would be easily transferable into an app. So for those who are interested, come and ask me later more about the actual details of the psychological intervention. This is the app. Um, so you can see that uh, it has two main functions. One is the guided imagery. Um, and these are little imagery audios where you can listen to um, an audio that replicates some of the things that you've done in the therapy, for example, uh, encourages you to simulate some of those helpful behaviors or has emotion regulations, strategies. And then there's the high, how am I feeling functionality. Uh, that was pretty much developed uh, entirely by the young people's group in terms of giving suggestions of what to do. Then you rate those suggestions and the app suggests more, is more likely to suggest what you rated um, as more helpful. So it learns a little bit. Um, so we're trying to collect most of all feasibility data and feedback from the participants and also to get an idea whether this is actually helpful in reducing the self-harm. And we're in the last month of data collection, so that's a work in progress story. I uh, just want to show you one thing that I'm quite happy about, which is the multicolored bit of the slides of our recruitment is all young people who came from self-referrals for, for example, posters in the community or Facebook. Uh, and this is important because we know that this is a quite uh, secretive and stigmatized behavior. And so a lot of these young people don't normally seek out for help. So we were able to have a group of which half of them hadn't um, come through mental health services. Um, and again, uh, you can see in terms of what's highlighted in red, only seven of our 38 participants were actually receiving support from a mental health team, and the majority of them hadn't had any contact in the previous six months, for example, with emergency department or emergency services. So we're quite happy that we managed to attract and reach out. Um, and this is just a snapshot of how heterogeneous this group is, and you can see that about a third of the young people who took part uh, were self-harming more than weekly um, and quite severely in terms of needing medical attention. And all I can say in terms of what we know at this moment is that we're quite happy that, for example, more than half of those who received the intervention immediately rather than in the delayed group after three months completed uh, the whole protocol. Um, and at least at three months, we didn't have too many uh, young people who sort of didn't want to respond to our assessments anymore. So that's an encouraging uh, start because we know how challenging it is to engage this group and in general how challenging it is to keep people involved uh, in this um, digital app and trials research. So uh, I'm going to conclude with just some initial feedback that we're collecting, um, positive things. Some of the young people said, using mental imagery and visualization, I liked it because I can do it anywhere and nobody knows that I'm doing it, so it's a helpful strategy. Cons, um, when you're so upset, like typically the moments that precede self-harm, you really don't think about picking up your phone. So a very simple thing that made us reflect on, was this a good idea or not? On the other hand, when we were doing the recruitment, a lot of the self-referrals that we got through the internet initially contacted us, and then when we described that this was a study that involved two therapy sessions, said like, oh, okay, thanks, I would have just liked the app, though. So 
it's going to be interesting to weigh out in the end what, what would be the best approach. Is this something to support an intervention or is this something that would be better just as a standalone? Um, and then suggestions. We had a lot of, uh, obviously, of concerns in terms of how to make this absolutely um, confidential and in terms of like if, if the young person leaves their uh, phone open, there is no reference in the app to self-harm, so you wouldn't guess what it is about. Uh, and there's no push notifications and anything. But some of the suggestions that we get is that I would, like, I would have liked more of that, more suggestions and, and notifications coming from the app. So some promising evidence that uh, it's, it, it seems to fill an unmet need and uh, young people were interested and a lot of work in progress. Um, and I'd like to finish by thanking the young people involved, my collaborators <coughs> and the funders, and thank you for your attention.